Hi everybody and welcome back to the channel. Now this week's video is another one in the classic cameras from the past. Now in my last video I did mention that I'd put a bid in for another uh, classic camera on eBay. Uh, I didn't tell you which model it was uh, but I said it was a Voigtlander and some of you have suggested that I'd be bidding on the Voigtlander Superb TLR camera. Well I won the auction and the camera that uh, I won wasn't the Voigtlander Superb, it was this. It was the Voigtlander uh, Brilliant uh, TLR camera. It's the S model and that denotes it's a focusing um, brilliant camera. Now to focus this camera it's a bit different to uh, using say the, the, the Voigtlander Superb in the fact that when you look in the viewfinder it's got the brilliant viewfinder if you can just see that little circle that's the area that you focus on and you use the pop-up uh, magnifier to focus on that area. Now some people have said that that is uh, quite difficult to use on this camera uh, but um, I'll give it a go and see 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 if uh, see if I see if I can use it. But uh, failing that, I'll just use the uh, scale focus and um, hyperfocal distance. It's got a lovely depth of field scale on the viewing lens there, uh, where you can set your distances, etc. So if I can't focus, I'll use I'll use that. Now I do own another one of these. It's a nineteen thirties. Voigtlander Brilliant. Um, this is a 1945 model so you might ask why did I uh, want another one of these cameras? Well the reason I wanted this one um, was because of the uh, one of the reasons was the lens on this. This is a, a Helia lens, it's a top of the range lens where on the 1930s model, uh, Brilliant model, it was the Voita um, uh, lens. Uh, this, this lens uh, it is a better lens than that. I own a few uh, Voigtlander folding cameras with Helia lenses and it really is a, a beautiful lens. Um, the other reasons, the the 1930s model, um, as I say, it had the Voita lens and its maximum aperture was f7.7. The, the shutter speeds ran on that from 1 25th of a second and the fastest speed was 1 50th. And I think, as I say, it, it ran from 7.7 .7, uh, to f16. So I think it just had uh, three apertures. Where this camera, uh, the lens, the, the Helio lens, uh, its maximum aperture is f3.5. And it stops all the way down to uh, f16. And in fact, if you use this little lever at the side, it goes past the f16 mark and looking at the iris I'd say that this camera actually stops down to f22. The shutter speeds that you can set on this are time, um, b, uh, one second up to three hundredth of a second. So all in all it's a lot more versatile camera than the older model that I have purely because I have a bigger range of shutter uh, speeds and apertures to choose on this camera. Now I have tried this camera before, just testing it in the back garden. I wanted to test how this um, automatic frame stop worked on this camera because I have heard that there are problems uh, using modern films um, using this mechanism. Uh, modern films are a lot thinner than the older, the older films, the older films, and this camera was designed, as I say, for the older, thick, thicker films. And when you wind this camera on, this lever jumps upwards that way and it stops you winding on and, until you pull that back. So in other words, it stops you from uh, double exposing, taking two uh, photographs on the, on the same uh, frame number. But there are problems with this and I, I'm glad I tried it because they, I tried it using this and the frame spacing was all over the place. We got wide, wide gaps between the negatives, narrow gaps and, and in some parts it was uh, actually overlapping. So I've disengaged that that mechanism. Um, a lot of people do that with these cameras and I'm simply going to use the red window at the back to count the frames and I'm sure that that will be accurate. So for my own peace of mind I just want to go out with this camera and test it just to make sure that there's no light leaks that in fact the the numbers uh, when I use them on the through the red window are giving me equal uh, frame uh, spacing and just generally to, to check 
although it was advertised as being serviced this camera but just to check that the shutter speeds and the apertures are giving me the near enough uh, correct exposure. I'm going to use this uh, this um, meter, it's the Voigtlander VC2 meter and it, it will attach uh, to the side of the uh, of the brilliant camera on the hot shoe there or the cold shoe and I'll just press the button there and adjust it until the green light shows and transfer the shutter speed uh, and apertures that I want onto the lens and that's how I'm going to uh, uh, take the pictures and it just means that uh, it's all in a compact unit then I'm not having to carry a separate handheld meter I've loaded the camera with Ilford HB5 and I'm going to uh, semi-stand development I'm going to do that over an hour with two inversions one at the uh, 20 minute marks each 20 minute mark uh, and then and just develop for an hour in as I say a 510 pyro and just see how that turns out now the weather today in Otley that's where I'm going to take the pictures is uh, a mixture of sunshine rain and and mist uh, it's uh, it's more misty uh, I'm hoping it will be uh, towards the river in the town centre um, and I'm hoping that this uh, uh, Vo Vo the, the Voigtlander Helia lens is going to give me some of the uh, you know more older nostalgic looking pictures the the 1930s model certainly does that and I'm hoping this camera will do the same because I do love that look so I'll get sorted now and uh, and uh, have a walk around uh, Otley Town Centre and see how this camera performs and um, better still see how I perform with this camera Right, I'm all set up now I've got the camera the Voigtlander Brilliant uh, uh, S focusing brilliant loaded with the uh, Ilford HP5 I'm going to rate it probably around about 300 ISO 320 uh, and I'm going to use this meter it's the Voigtlander VC2 meter just give it a little bit more extra exposure because uh, I do find that beneficial when I'm when I'm using the scanning hybrid workflow uh, today it's uh, it's a little bit misty but it's bright so I'm just going to go around my local town Otley and just test uh, this camera see if everything's uh, working okay so go see if I can find somewhere to park and have a little uh, little walk round so I quite like this uh, sort of composition. We've got this wall uh, curving around into the picture and the path, and then we've got the cottage in the background there. I've just taken uh, a light reading, and the light reading's saying a uh, thirtieth uh, of a second to f8. So with this camera, I can't set thirtieth of a second. It's in the old style. It's twenty-fifth. I think that's going to be a little bit uh, slow to handhold. So I'm going to do it at uh, a 50th of a second, uh, roundabout, just a little bit up from f5.6, between 5.6 and 8, and I think that should be, uh, should be okay. So I'll take the photograph now and see what this one looks like. Right, I'll just move on a little bit. It's absolutely freezing today. I think it's around about minus three, minus four. So, probably gonna have to put my gloves on. There's some lo lovely little uh, alleyways, etc., in uh, in Otley. I would have preferred it a bit wetter, but I'm just testing the camera really, so. So this is a, another cobble street that I'm going to take a picture of. Last time I photographed this was uh, a night scene. So I'll get the camera set up, take a light reading. Right, taking a light reading and it's uh, telling me uh, 60th of a second f8, so it'll be 50th of a second with this camera. But as I've said, uh, I'm going to have to use the depth of field scale because this um, my hands are so cold. This little uh, yellow magnifier has to focus on that patch. I don't know if you can see that in the viewfinder. I'll show you it close up later, but 
it's very very difficult and I think really I'd have to use it on a tripod to to get focus with it so I'm going to use the, uh, the depth of field to get stuff in focus with this shot so uh, I said it was um, six of a second at f8 so it's f8 and I'm gonna to have to use 50th of a second and then set the hyperfocal distance on the lens and everything from four meters to infinity should be in focus hopefully Right, let's get that one. Carry on. I don't believe it, the lamp's still lit. I took a picture of this a few months ago in the daytime and I used uh, what they call ICM intentional camera movement just to give like a, a dreamy shot to the picture the lamp was lit uh, then and it's still on now so obviously they can't turn it off so I'm just going to take a picture from here again use a uh, hyperfocal distance and uh, <clears throat> as I've got, I've got somebody in the picture there uh, but I'll wait till somebody else comes in the picture get them walking down the path and get the railings in leading into the picture at this side and the wall at this side see how that turns out right that's got that shot uh, I used the hyperfocal distance again the exposure was a uh, um, 50th of a second at f8 now there's one thing you have to remember when you're using these types of cameras uh, if they don't have a double exposure prevention uh, mechanism that every time you take the photograph wind onto the next frame um, if you don't you will forget and you'll double expose uh, this camera has a or had a uh, double exposure prevention lever on it but I've disabled it and I'll show you why I did that uh, when we take a, a closer look at the camera but uh, keep it in mind, always wind on straight after you've taken the picture. Otherwise you will forget and you will double expose. Now for this picture we've got this nice uh, cobble straight and then if you look carefully on the uh, side of the uh, the hill we call it, we call it a chevin there's a, a white cottage and I'm just going to wait until the sun bursts through the clouds and uh, hopefully I'll get that cottage in and uh, and get some nice uh, reflection from these cobbles. I've taken the light reading, I'm down to f16 and I'm on one one hundredth of a second it only goes to 100, not 125 on this camera. So I'll just wait till the sun pokes, pokes its head through. Right, I got that image. Uh, just poked its head through. We'll see how good this lens is shooting into the sun. And, uh, and a cut to the glare off the cobbles. come down towards the river now and uh, it's quite uh, quite misty here so don't see what I can come up with 
I quite like this picture where we've got the uh, the ferns, uh, trees uh, just going off into the mist at an angle. So we've got this first one and then they're leading away. So again, the exposure's uh, uh, 50th of a second at F11 and I'll again use the hyperfocal distance. So I've just taken a picture of these benches and then we've got the river wharf and then the bridge in the background and I thought I'd just try this focusing uh, 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 magnifier again on, on, and focusing on the, the little ground grass uh, area on the, on the screen and I found that if I do that with both eyes open focusing with both eyes looking at that magnifier it uh, does seem to uh, be easy it does seem to pop in and out of focus so I focused on this front part of this bench here and um, and then uh, hopefully I'm at f11 so I might get some fall off in depth of field but it'll be interesting to see if this bench has, has come into focus using that so fingers crossed and hope that works so I've learnt something there that uh, just keep both eyes open when you're focusing Right, I'll get back home now, uh, get the uh, get the film developed, the role developed, and see if the pictures have turned out. See how the uh, cameras perform, the Helio lens, and uh, how I've performed really using the the uh, the lens to control the uh, the depth of field to get things in and out of focus. This camera is like any other uh, TLR camera to use you're using them at waist level the big difference with these is that you've only got a small uh, patch on the viewing screen where you, you can where you can acquire focus uh, you have to use the magnifying glass which pops up like most TLRs but you've only got this small area and I found it quite difficult to use that um, it doesn't you know pop in and out of focus like you you, you might think it would do so I've tended to use the, the lens, the hyperfocal distance, the scale focus uh, to try and get things in, in, into focus. The, um, the, the upside of that is that because you're having to use uh, the apertures to control the depth of field, it does teach you about um, you know, using apertures and how apertures affect depth of field. So it does teach you that but it does make it a little bit more awkward when you're trying to focus closer to subjects it does be, get uh, more difficult trying to estimate the depth of field and the distances etc so you know it's um it's nowhere near using this camera as easy as using a roliflex from the point of view that the roliflex uh, the other types of cameras like that the yashica mat uh, the uh, Mamiya TLR camera, they are really a universal cameras where you can, especially the Mamiya TLR camera, where you can, uh, you know, you can focus from infinity and you can go to beyond life size with that. With the Roliflex you have to use filters and the same with the Yashica to get closer, but you can focus at them close distances. So I really wanted to use this lens wide open at uh, f uh, 3.5 and just see this out of focus that the Helio lens gives but unfortunately I can't do that because as I say it's just so difficult to try and uh, focus the camera at close distances so I've tried to use it uh, to smaller apertures and hopefully I'm getting that depth of field uh, to get everything or most everything into focus but we shall see so get back now and uh, as I say get the film uh, developed So let's take a look at this uh, camera. Now 
The first thing I want to talk about is the way this camera focuses. And the pictures that I took that you've seen in the video, I was very happy with them. Uh, I was very happy with the lens uh, rendered the, the, the tones in the pictures to give that uh, older nostalgic look to them. But uh, the depth of field on, on most of the pictures was not what I expected. Uh, it didn't fall where I wanted it to do. And the last picture that I took of the, the, uh, the, the park bench at the side of the river, I did actually focus on the front of that bench. It was definitely in focus using the, uh, the yellow magnifier on the, uh, the ground glass uh, spot in the viewfinder. Uh, and yet when I uh, looked at the picture, it was out of focus. And it's only the fact that I uh, stopped the lens down to f11 that I got an acceptable picture. And I think the reason why that's happening is that the focusing uh, from the, the viewing lens to the uh, taking lens is what you might call out of sync. So how it works is when you move the, the uh, viewing lens uh, to focus in the viewfinder, it moves the, you can see it moves the, the taking lens via these cogs around the exterior of the lenses. But over the years they do get worn and I think it's gone out of sync because if you listen, it's slipping. Once it slips like that, it's out of sync because it's not giving the correct uh, focus on the ground glass for the distance. And it means that the, these scales at the top that I've been using uh, are not going to be as, as accurate as they should be. And that's why the depth of field wasn't falling where I thought it would do. So I'm not going to use the focusing mechanism uh, to focus in the viewfinder on this camera. I'm going to uh, set it manually on the uh, actual uh, taking lens. And I'll do that by uh, open the camera back, uh, put, it, put the camera on a tripod, get it level, and then this is a ground glass off an old camera. I'll tape that to the film gate, and then using my loop, I'll focus at a set distance, say four feet, and I'll set that mark, mark that on the taking lens. I'll mark, mark it on the lens and on the body somehow. So I know when I set it to that point, it's actually at four feet. And I'll probably do it at four feet, six feet, uh, 10 feet, 16 feet, 20 feet, and infinity. So I have got these accurate markings to work from. So that, that is one problem with this camera that you might encounter when you buy one. So be aware of that. The other thing with the camera, as I mentioned in the video, um, this camera came with a, a mechanism where once you've wound it on with the red window to number one, when you wound on, took that picture and went to number two, the camera automatically locks and stops you from uh, double exposing, which is great. But the problem is that when this camera was designed, it, the films, the actual films were, were thicker than modern films that are quite a bit thinner. So it doesn't read the length of the film correctly. And uh, you, your spacing is all over the place. It, you can uh, overlap on frames. There can be wide gaps, narrow gaps. Uh, to, to overcome that, the only way to do it is to disengage this mechanism. Now, it's uh, easy to do. If I can do it, anybody can do it. You just undo that screw, take the knob off, the winding knob. There's one, two, three, four, five, six screws. Undo those and the whole plate comes off. And uh, you'll see inside, you've just got to uh, disengage a couple of springs and it stops this from working. And once that's done, you don't use the frame counter there. You use the frame counter at the back through the red uh, window. Uh, fortunately it's got a blind which you can open and close so when you wind it on to say number one or whatever frame number you're on once you've wound to that you can close it so light's not uh, affecting the film. So there are a couple of the things that you might run into uh, using one of these cameras is the actual focusing and this, uh, this locking me mechanism on the wind on. Uh, let's go back to the front of the camera. Uh, as I say this is a an f3.5 helio lens and you set the apertures via this lever here it runs from f3.5 to f16 in fact it goes further than f16 i think it's probably going down to f22 so that's for setting the aperture and then this ring here there is for setting the shutter speed 
so you can set, set the shutter speed anywhere from time it goes to bulb one second to three hundredth of a second so let's say we set it to a half a second you cock the shutter there and fire it by just pushing up and it's very quiet and it's very smooth uh, when you move the aperture you can see there there's a little mark and it shows you the actual apertures that you're setting at the underneath of the lens it's got a cable release socket which is good uh, and while we're looking at the bottom uh, we've got these little feet that the camera stands on it keeps it level and then we've got the uh, the tripod socket there the actual one, original one it's uh, too big for modern tripods so you need an adapter just to reduce the size so it'll fit the the modern tripod uh, this side of the camera it has a little door there I've got a lens cleaning cloth in there originally it was fitted with a yellow filter and uh, I think it was a light meter uh, but they get lost over the years so I've just put a little uh, a cleaning cloth in there just handy to, to use and then we've got the, the cold shoe there uh, where I mounted the uh, the, the Voigtlander VC 2 meter so that's good and you can, you can mount a, a flash there because it does have a, a PC socket on the, on the front of the camera there uh, the top of the camera pretty straightforward it lifts up like that quite easily and it pops open and, and you can see the, the little ground area there and that's the yellow uh, magnifier where you, uh, you 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 focus onto on that ground glass area, but as I say, it's not easy to use, and you probably end up not using that. It's also got a sports finder, so you've got that window at the front there, and when you look through that hole, get your eye right up to it, you can actually use this camera at eye level. So it's uh, it's very handy, is that? It closes up very easy. Uh, to load the camera or un uh, to uh, open the back. You're just pressing those two levers and it pulls open and like all Voigtlander cameras it's the very easy to load uh, pull the knob out lift that latch up so pull that up so it's loose and then you get your film this is a, a wasted film just pop it in the back what I tend to do is pull it up like that uh, Take this spool, take the actual spool out, and then just thread it onto the spool like that. So it's wound so far onto it. Then just pull it across, pop it into there, into there, and then lock it into place. And it's that easy. A lot, a lot of the uh, Whitelander cameras. Uh, work like that and they're very easy to load. Just wind it on, put a little bit of pressure on with your thumb at the bottom so it tightens it up. Close the back, open the blind, wind it onto one, number one and uh, then shut the blind and you're ready to take the first picture. Always keep in mind that when you do work this way, after you've taken the shot, always remember to wind on uh, to the next shot. Um, don't leave it because you will forget and uh, double expose. So all in all, uh, a great little camera. Uh, it takes it take some nice pictures. I think when I get this uh, this uh, distance scale on the taking lens uh, set up, it's going to be uh, better to use. And then comparing it with the the old 1932 um, Voigtlander Brilliant, you can see it's come on a little bit over the years. And um, just take that cloth out. And um, it's a, a little bit bigger than this, a little bit heavier, but you've got more functionality with this camera than that. Uh, as I say, this camera uh, needs good light to, 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 be, to, be, to be using it. You can use this camera in lower lighting conditions because it's a much uh, faster taking lens. So that's it, the Voigtlander Brilliant S. Would I recommend it? Well, yes I would. It's an experience using them. Uh, it keeps these old cameras going. But I do think that you could have problems with the focusing mechanism. I think a lot of them over the years will have got worn. And uh, you will have problems, or I have had definitely problems, a lot of people do, with this, uh, this auto stop function. But if you just, as I say, disable that, you'll have no problems. 
so yeah i would recommend it nice camera nice camera to use a beautiful lens and uh I'm going to get this set up now and then I'll, I'll go out again and just see if the depth of field improves using my uh, own distance scales. So that's the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed the pictures I took with the Voigtlander Brilliant S. And I hope you found the uh, little uh, uh, look around this camera and uh, me showing you some of the pitfalls that you might encounter with the focusing and the frame spacing. I hope that was helpful for you. Uh, but my honest opinion on this camera, uh, I think this camera uh, is, is, is a bridge too far from the original uh, concept of the uh, brilliant camera. The original one was uh, uh, designed to be um, a simple, easy to use, uh, medium format camera where you just look through the, uh, the, viewing, looked at the viewing screen which uh, it, as its name implies, it's brilliant. It's very clear to view. Uh, but that was just used for a, a composition. And all the work was done on the taking lens. And on the taking lens, on the original ones, you'd have a, a scale, uh, close focus, uh, mid focus, and mid focus to infinity. So you just sort of guesstimated the distance, get the lens stopped down quite a bit, uh, set the you shutter and aperture, uh, to the uh, lighting conditions at that time and take the picture and it was that simple with that camera with this camera uh, just because they've put um, what you might call a ground glass area a small area in the center of the screen and then added a yellow magnifier doesn't turn this into a proper TLR camera it is very very awkward to use on a proper TLR camera uh, such as the Roliflex the Mamiya uh, uh, TLR cameras, the uh, Yashica, Yashica mat, they work differently in the, in the respect that the, the lens are connected to one panel and as you focus with the top lens the whole panel moves together. So it's a much more se secure a working system. With this one you've got to rely on this area staying in cal calibration and that it's not going to move over the years. And um, I just feel that it's not engineered that well um, to be accurate uh, for, for many many years it will uh, at some stage start to go out of sync uh, where the, the top one and the bottom one aren't registering correctly so I think they've gone that little bit too far with it and uh, over complicated the uh, original concept so that's my honest opinion about the camera although I did enjoy going out with it uh, I always do with the old uh, vintage cameras you know this camera I don't know uh, where this camera's been all its life what pictures what type of pictures it's taken how many pictures it's taken you just feel like you're holding a little bit of history in your hands and uh, you get to feel a little bit nostalgic and it inspires you to go out and take pictures and get pictures that look different to the modern lenses you get an older more nostalgic look using these cameras but this camera will make a nice addition to my uh, vintage uh, camera collection. I've enjoyed using it. It's, it's been an experience. And uh, once I've uh, set up my own distances, uh, I'll try it again and let you know how I go with that. So if you've enjoyed this uh, video, please uh, give me a like, a thumbs up, uh, hit that notification bell. Uh, better still, subscribe to my channel. Uh, if you have any questions, leave them below and I'll get back to you. And as I always say, Stay safe and I'll see you all in the next video.